I wanted to talk to you about why you need to rethink your hybrid migrations. So for the longest time ever, almost a decade now, not much has fundamentally changed with exchange hybrid migrations. Much has been the same, right? We've got an exchange hybrid server, we can publish it to the internet or use the hybrid agent. And once we've got Azure AD Connect up and running, then we can do what we need to do. We can migrate mailboxes over and clients like Outlook mostly reconfigure automatically. They save the OST, they cache their data over to the other side. Exchange hybrid migrations in particular has been one of those areas where from the start, the migration was more like a traditional on-premises or, or even a cross-forest migration, to perhaps put it more, more accurately, where we could migrate somebody's mailbox. And if we set things up properly, they wouldn't know what we'd done. The technology worked together so seamlessly that we could move people with zero impact to you know, very early on, minimal impact. And more recent improvements have allowed things like coexistence with things like shared mailboxes on premises, permissions to work cross premises as well in some scenarios. So things have improved, they've made it easier to migrate. But other things have changed as well. So back when we started doing exchange hybrid migrations, things were still called exchange online. Some of the first uh, proper Office 365 migrations were with Live at Edu. Uh, and that soon uh, morphed into what was known as Office 365. They onboarded BPOS as well. And Office 365 was Office 365 for a long time, and it was a key productivity suite. Over time, we saw tools like Intune come in. We saw additional tools. The EMS suite became quite popular. The E5 licensing came along. Uh, Skype for Business became a phone system. And then we saw Teams come along, and really that exploded the way that people used the rest of Office 365. So we would often see that phase one of a project where people would move because perhaps hardware was, was out of date, uh, or there was some other technical driver to move online. Fundamentally, though, Microsoft 365, Teams, all of that changing the way that the products are bundled and the way that Teams has really opened the door to collaboration as well as meetings has meant that actually exchange is, is good. You've got to get it moved. It's kind of a prerequisite for, for many things, but it isn't the, the fundamental goal of that project. People aren't buying Microsoft 365 E3 or E5 licenses just so they can have email in the cloud. It's other things that are driving that purchase. And you would have thought that Microsoft Teams would have, have made a big change to that, uh, but it didn't. Originally, Microsoft Teams did drive more Exchange Online migrations because if you wanted Teams, then if you were on Exchange 2010 or 2013, then really you needed to move email to the cloud. Now, of course, Exchange 2010 is well out of support. Yes, people still have it. And Exchange 2013 didn't quite have that same impact in terms of take up a bit like 2007 uh, you had people on 2003 they all moved to 2010 and people have moved either from 2010 to 2016 or they've moved to exchange online so if they want teams now at this point then they can enable hybrid OAuth and they can use a lot of services inside Microsoft 365 uh, without needing to to migrate email first now, another thing that's changed is because people are often buying Microsoft 365, E3 or E5, uh, and people are absolutely more security aware. Uh, people are working remotely, obviously, more often. Uh, there's less usage of VPNs. They make use of cloud services fundamentally terrible. Uh, then this means that people are implementing Microsoft 365 with a security and compliance angle First up, it's not let's move over to Exchange Online. Um, we'll move over with Modern Auth or Basic Auth enabled. Then we'll start layering on security and compliance features afterwards. Fundamentally, they want to move to a secure service. So you start up a new tenant today. It's got security defaults in it. And security defaults will gradually switch on multi-factor authentication for your users. Uh, and that does mean you need to communicate that to people. You need to tell them that they need the Authenticator app. Uh, you can't just leave it to the service to, to onboard them. You need to onboard them 
with user communications. And there's also the compliance features as well. You know, it's it, it's unusual that I will work with a customer and they will say, we'll, we'll leave all of the DLP stuff, we'll leave all of the, the compliance stuff until later on. We'll just move as we are. It used to be the case that perhaps what we might discuss for the Exchange Online migration is how we will perhaps mirror backup policies and journal policies to make sure that we didn't lose any data fidelity or any data retention settings when we moved across. So that if we were backing up Exchange for six months, then Exchange Online's built-in retention capabilities in combination with the, the way that the service is, is built mean that we'll be able to restore data if somebody had deleted it and purged it themselves uh, for up to six months or up to 12 months or wh whatever those requirements are. With things like GDPR, uh, meaning that we need to think more about how long we keep data, it's less likely an organisation will say, well, we'll just switch it on, keep everyone on, on hold forever. They will think about these policies more carefully and they will also be thinking about how they use those policies across the service and what other things they'll use with them. It might be that the whole goal of buying the service uh, was security driven. So getting value early on from sensitivity labels, from some of the more advanced compliance or advanced security features is going to be absolutely key to being able to prove that there was value in the service. So expect your Exchange Online migration to need to take these things into account. What will happen to data and email as soon as it's moved across if the status quo no longer exists? You know, those are fundamental things that you, you need to consider. Uh, and Exchange isn't always going to be the first to migrate. Often it was the phase one project. You know, we would be in first. It was the, the no-brainer, let's move email. It is uh, a solid commodity service that most people, most exchange admins, no longer want their career to be based around patching and managing exchange servers. And as we know, once you move across, there's still a bunch of stuff to do. Uh, and SharePoint was, unfortunately, you know, five, six years ago, it, it wasn't as uh, uh, as well-loved as as exchanges in terms of its reliability, the way that it worked being equivalent to whatever you were migrating from. So file migrations in particular to OneDrive were not the, the most popular, uh, primarily because of the sync client and limitations in the service itself. So number of files that can, can sync, the views, the file sizes, and the sync client, the reliability of that, the manageability of that. And compared to some of the competitors on the market, uh, it, it was often seen to be, be lacking. Uh, and some clients, some customers did have a lot of success doing that early on. Uh, but there were, there were some, uh, some, some disasters, to, to put it mildly. These days, though, and for, for years now, one, the OneDrive client, the one that's built into Windows 10, is, is very, very solid. And there's lots and lots of organizations that, through things like FastTrack, have migrated all their data, all their file shares into the service. And really, the ones that have been unhappy are the ones that didn't do all of the associated planning around that. You know, the user communications, making sure their networks were right. Fundamentally, the technology works well if you've done some of the prerequisites, like making sure the clients are ready, making sure the network's ready, and planning your information architecture, doing some file-based remediation, uh, planning it properly so you're not just doing a lift and shift of especially things like group or departmental file shares to the service. It works really, really well, which means that when you approach an exchange online migration, then you're going to find that people have already done something in the service. You know, It might be teams that they've deployed. It might be that they've, that they've moved everybody's home drives to, to OneDrive and they they have uh, enrolled machines within Tune as well and are beginning to use conditional access. You yourself may have implemented hybrid modern authentication as part of that uh, against your Exchange 2016 implementation, which means some of those core assumptions when you're thinking about how you move to Exchange Online, when you're first in the door to the service, then you don't have to think too much about how other people are using the service at that point because if you make a change, such as implementing hybrid, making a change to e email flow between the tenant and your on-premises environment, if you're first through the door, that's not going to affect anybody else apart from people you're testing with. But if people are using 
OneDrive extensively, sharing files out of that, uh, then you need to think about how mail is flowing from Microsoft 365 through Exchange Online into your current environment and making sure that you don't affect that. And of course, wider changes. So perhaps they've just synced user objects at this point to the tenant and you need to now synchronize distribution groups, contact objects uh, and, and more to the service. You need to get the full gal, you need to get all of the recipients into the service as well. Those are things where you've now got to make a change that impacts more and more people. So there's, there's those things that have happened to us. So hybrid hasn't changed. Teams has kept the status quo. Security and compliance hasn't really um, hasn't really changed. The fact that people are implementing it has. You know, it's become more and more important. And of course, you know, we're not first through the door with hybrid. But coming back to security, fundamentally, I think the security issues like Hafnium that we've seen over the last few months, uh, there was another one just about a, a year ago, early 2020 as well. They've shaken confidence in the on-premises uh, exchange product. And that's that's quite unfair because it's had a very good history. But long-time uh, exchange veterans who've migrated lots and lots of organizations to Exchange Online will no doubt be familiar with those conversations with the security team where an exchange environment that hasn't been published to the internet, we now need to open the firewall rules to allow mail flow in and out of the system and often to make sure that we can have an accelerated migration by allowing access to the migration endpoints. Uh, even if we're using the hybrid modern agent as well, there might be scenarios where we do want direct access to particular servers so we can have multiple migration endpoints to get the best possible throughput from the on-premises migration for a speedy migration. And those conversations are understandably going to be a lot harder because you, you could argue the point a couple of years ago that Exchange has been a pretty uh, good platform uh, with its security record. And there was a point where even the Exchange team was saying, was saying so and highlighting that perhaps you didn't need to pre-authenticate so much you could publish to the outside world. Uh, there's, there's certainly an absolutely good reason for, for pushback on that, which means things like publishing services for AutoDiscover um, so that clients that are outside the network and are not VPN'd in can do that initial hop through are going to be harder. Thankfully, the way that the modern Outlook client works means that sometimes you that the client can direct connect to Office 365 if a mailbox is there, which solves some of those problems, but it means you need to plan and test for that scenario. And of course, if you are going to use Hybrid, then you've got to really look at the hybrid agent, the modern hybrid rather than classic hybrid as your go-to solution to avoid having to publish it externally. So fundamentally, a lot of things have remained the same about Exchange. The good things are still there. We move mailboxes the same way. People get some of those benefits like the cached mailbox is still there on the other side and we can make it a smooth process. But we need to think about how people are already using the service and the fact that we're joining them rather than were the, the early adopters and the, the first people to the service and how those security and compliance aspects are being used as well. So fundamentally, we need to start thinking about changing the way that we think about hybrid migrations. So read more on Practical 365, where, of course, we've got tons of stuff on hybrid migrations, going back the the full history of Exchange Online migrations up to the current up-to-date news, including a blog post that goes into a bit more detail on this exact subject.